I squared S is getting more popular by the day for connecting a digital source to a DAC. Some say it's the best, but is it? I squared S is an abbreviation for Inter Integrated Circuit Sound. Normal people would have abbreviated to IIS or double IS, but techies like mathematical notations and thus made it I squared S. It is a standard developed by a Philips division that now is independent and called NXP semiconductors. It defines the transport of audio data between audio chips like the SPDIF receiver chip and the DAC chip. It was intended to be used within equipment. The standard version uses three lines, the serial clock SCK, sometimes called the bit clock BCLK, then the word select WS, sometimes referred to as left right clock LRCLK, or frame sync FS, and the third line does the serial data SD, that alternatively carries the left and right channel audio data. Although SD is the official name, SData, SDIN, SDOUT, DACDAT and ADCDAT are also used. Let me explain this timing diagram. The serial clock runs at a sampling rate as indicated by the dotted vertical lines. The word select indicates whether the next serial data bits are for the left or the right channel. Zero is left, one is right. The serial data is a pure PCM signal for alternating channels as indicated by the word select line. When digital audio was developed, Sony developed the SDIF standard, where in short two B and C cables were used, one for each channel. The most common forms are SDIF2 PCM and SDIF2 DSD. They are almost exclusively used for professional applications. When Sony and Philips introduced the compact disc, they also introduced the Sony Philips digital interface format, abbreviated to SPDIF for the consumer market. Both the galvanic version using RCA connectors and an optical version using Toslink connectors were developed. For the galvanic version the name SPDIF was used and the optical connection became known as Toslink after the name of the optical connector. Toslink is an abbreviation of Toshiba Link. At the same time Sony and Philips developed a variation for the professional audio industry and had it standardized by both the Audio Engineering Society, AES for short, and the European Broadcasting Union, EBU for short. It works at a higher voltage, up to 5 volts, where SPDIF uses 0.5 volts and uses a 110 ohm balance cable terminated with XLR3 connectors. That standard became known as the AES EBU digital interface. Later on, a single ended 75 ohm version was defined so that could be connected over video lines in the video production centers. Nowadays, SPDIF is often called coax and Toslink optical. All four are now grouped in the AES3 and IEC 60958 interface standards. Apart from the small differences in status bits that in AES EBU are more aimed at professional use, the formats are fully identical. They have the clock signal embedded in the audio data. It works like this. Digital signals are in fact analog square waves looking like this. In all four AES3 versions this basic square wave is in fact the clock signal and the zero at the same time. Ones are formed by a square wave of double the frequency. By alternating between the square waves of either frequency both ones and zeros can be sent. This is how such a signal would look like, with the clock cycles indicated by the dotted vertical lines. Whether a zero or a one is sent can only be seen by looking for a polarity change within a clock cycle. Looking at the first cycle we see the signal being high during the entire cycle. There is no change in polarity, meaning it is a zero. The second cycle has a transition from low to high halfway the clock cycle and therefore is a one. 
It also could have been a transition from high to low. It's a polarity change within the cycle that counts. The third cycle remains low, so no polarity change, thus a zero. The fourth cycle remains high, again no polarity change within the clock, thus a zero. The fifth cycle goes from low to high halfway, so it's a one. Unfortunately, square waves as drawn here cannot exist in the real world, since that would require unlimited bandwidth. Normally square waves are more or less distorted and under bad conditions might end up looking more like this. Still, that's no problem as long as the distortion is within limits like here. The input circuit of the DA converter looks at certain points within the clock signal to determine whether the signal is high or low. As long as the signal remains within specifications, it will still work without errors as can be seen here. But it's a signal that requires a lot of bandwidth and as little interference as possible. The use of a poor quality cable, the presence of a ground loop or other mishap can easily mutilate the signal like this. At first this might not look that much different from the other signal I showed, but let's see how the input circuit of the DA converter interprets it. The first measurement within the first clock cycle reads a positive, but only just. The second measurement is also positive, so the result must be a zero. The second clock cycle starts with a very low, that will be interpreted as a low of course, and a high. Since there is a transition within the clock cycle, it's a one. The third cycle shows a low and again a very low that will be read as a low. Two lows within the clock cycle mean a zero. The fourth cycle shows a low and a high resulting in a one and the fifth cycle shows a low and a high as well resulting again in a one. Now let's compare this to the original signal and you will see that the fourth clock cycle should have been a zero instead of a one. It might be clear that the quality of the digital signal is of importance. Of course there is redundancy in the system, but not just prior to the digital to analog conversion. There the digital signal needs to be accurate in both amplitude and timing. Don't forget the sending device keeps on sending data at a fixed rate. The argument is that having separate lines for clock and data would be better than superimposing the clock in the audio data as done with AES3. Admittedly having three lines and thus no need for superimposing is less complex. But the best digital transport I had in my setup one was the Grim Audio MU1. Its digital outputs were AES3 of which I used AES-EBU. I also compared the AES-EBU and I2S outputs of the Magnamano Ultra MK3 Farad on the Holo Audio Cyan 2 using Network Acoustics Eno AES EBU cable and a 30 cm 1204K HDMI cable, and I couldn't hear a difference. When testing the live deck, there was a difference. When I used the live internal clock as master when using I2S, but when the external clock was set, and thus the clock in the Magna Mano was the master, the quality was equal. Which isn't surprising since with AES EBU the clock in the Magna Mano functions as master too. If on an I2S either the sending or receiving device uses either poor sender or receiver chips, if the clock on either side is of poor quality. If the power supply on either side produces relatively high levels of noise, if there is a DC shift on either side or if the interlink is of poor quality, the sound quality will be influenced. The same goes for AES3 interfacing and yes, under poor conditions having the clock signal on a separate line could improve the situation. But on AES3 the number of components is smaller, so there might be more budget for each component. And yes, the chance of having an HDMI cable that underperforms is rather small since it wouldn't work good on the video connections it is made for. With AES3 the cable has to be 75 ohms for SPDIF and single-ended AES-EBU, 
and 110 ohm for balanced AES EBU. Toslink will in all cases be inferior given the relatively low quality of Toslink connectors used in equipment. It's a plastic transducer, not glass fiber. The conclusion is simple. If both the sending and receiving device have well implemented clocks and interfaces and a proper quality cable is used between them, there most likely will be no sound difference between I2S and AES EBU or SPDIF. If there is a poor clock circuit and or a less than optimal interface on one or even both sides, it's hard to predict whether I2S or AES3 will sound better. Although Toslink is a poorer transmission channel, it solves eventual DC problems and then might sound the best. I am fully aware that this is not the answer you were looking for. It means that you have to try it for yourself what sounds best. And when you do use proper quality cables, HDMI cables specified for 4K video made by a well known manufacturer will do. For AES, EBU or SPDIF use cables specified for digital audio again from well known manufacturers. It really makes a difference in sound quality unless you have a 400 euro stereo in a box system. And on that bombshell we come to the end of this video. There will be a new video next week. So subscribe to this channel or follow me on Patreon, Facebook, LinkedIn or Instagram to stay informed on when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video thumbs up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I am Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you next week. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.